My name is Elisha, and this is my story. It all began when Elijah, a great prophet of God, came to me while I was plowing in the fields. I was the son of Shaphat and lived in Abel Mehola. That day changed my life forever. Elijah walked by me and threw his cloak over me, a gesture that I knew signified a call to divine service. Without hesitation, I left the oxen and ran after Elijah. The years spent with Elijah were years of learning and preparation. I saw many miracles and learned much about God's faithfulness. Elijah was a fervent and courageous man of God. His faith was unshakable, and I aspired to have faith like his. One of the most memorable moments was when Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He mocked their ineffectiveness in calling down fire from heaven, and then, with a simple prayer, brought down fire from the Lord that consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even licked up the water in the trench around the altar. That day, God's power was manifested in an unmistakable way, and the people of Israel acknowledged that the Lord is God. After the triumph on Mount Carmel, I experienced many other events with Elijah. Each moment with him was a lesson in the nature of God and his power. But of all the days I spent with Elijah, the most extraordinary was the day of his departure. Elijah knew that his time had come. He asked me to stay while he went to Bethel, but I knew that this was a crucial moment and I insisted, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So we went together to Bethel. At Bethel, the sons of the prophets warned me about what was about to happen to my master. I already knew and told them to be quiet. Then Elijah asked me again to stay while he went to Jericho. But again I said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so we went to Jericho. Again the sons of the prophets warned me, and again, I told them to be quiet. So we went together to the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the waters, and they parted so that we could both cross over on dry land. And behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of us, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. I saw him and cried out, My father! my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen, and I saw him no more. Then I took hold of my clothes and tore them in two, reflecting on these extraordinary events and the path I was now walking. I realized the depth of the responsibility I carried. It was a weight, but also an immense privilege. The mantle of Elijah now draped over my shoulders was more than a symbol. It was a constant reminder of the call to serve God and his people with my whole being. I pondered the words of Elijah and the miracles he performed. Each of them was not just an act of power, but a lesson in the nature and character of God. And now it was my turn to continue this journey, to be a channel through which God's love, justice, and power could flow. As I walked the land of Israel, Carrying on the legacy of Elijah and the mission God had entrusted to me, I reflected constantly on these truths. Each day was a new opportunity to learn, grow, and serve. And in each act of service, I saw the hand of God moving, not just in my life, but in the lives of all the people of Israel. The journey would not be easy, but it would be filled with purpose and meaning guided by the hand of the God who calls, empowers, and uses his servants for his glory and the good of his people. I picked up the mantle that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. With Elijah's mantle I struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And he struck the waters, and they divided this way and that, and I crossed over. The sons of the prophets who were in Jericho saw this and said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet me and bowed down before me, who was now wearing Elijah's mantle. I was facing a new chapter in my life. My first action as a prophet occurred when the men of Jericho came to me, 
complaining that the waters of the city were bad and the land was barren. I said, bring me a new dish and put salt in it. They did so. So I went to the spring of water, threw the salt in it, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have made these waters clean. From now on there will be no more death or barrenness. And the waters were healed to this day, according to the word that I had spoken. The path of the prophet is one of learning and humility. I understood that, even though I was an instrument in the hands of God, I was still human subject to flaws and limitations. This understanding brought me a sense of humility and the constant need to seek God's guidance in every step, every word, every action. So, as I continued on my path, I carried with me this reflection, a reminder of the need to always seek God's wisdom and guidance in my ministry. Every interaction, every encounter, was an opportunity to represent God faithfully and authentically balancing justice with mercy and power with love. After that, I went to Mount Carmel, and from there I returned to Samaria. In Samaria, my journey continued with many signs and miracles. I recall a remarkable incident with a woman from Shunem. She was a remarkable woman who insisted that I eat at her house whenever I passed by. She even built a small room on the roof so that I could rest. In gratitude, I asked her what I could do for her. Despite her reluctance to ask for anything, my servant Gahatsi observed that she was childless and her husband was old. So I called her and said to her, By this time, in a year's time, you will embrace a son. She did not believe my words at first, but, as I had said, she conceived and gave birth to a son at that appointed time. The story of the Shunammite woman's son is particularly close to my heart. Years after his birth, the boy, now grown, went into the field to find his father among the reapers. Suddenly, he complained of a headache and was taken to his mother. At noon, he died in her arms. The woman, in her great faith, did not hesitate. She placed the boy in my room and closed the door. Then she came to find me. When I got home, I saw the dead boy lying on my bed. I went in, closed the door, and prayed to the Lord. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. I called Gahatsi and asked him to call the Shunammite woman. When she came in, I said, Take your son. She came, fell at my feet, and bowed down to the ground. Then she took her son and left. After restoring the Shunammite woman's son to life by the power of God, I retired to a corner of the house, deep in thought. The magnitude of the miracle that had just occurred was overwhelming. Life, that precious and mysterious gift, had been restored in the hands of a servant of God. I wondered about the power that flowed through me, a power that was not mine but borrowed, given by God to accomplish His purposes. I reflected on the nature of life and death, and on God's immense love and compassion in restoring life to the boy. I had been a mere instrument in the hands of the Creator. This act was not only a testament to God's power, but also to His deep concern for each of His children. Another defining moment in my ministry was when the widow of one of the sons of the prophets came to me. She was in despair because her husband had died and she was in debt. The creditor was about to take her two sons as slaves to pay off the debt. She cried out for my help, and I asked her what she had in the house. Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil, she replied. So I instructed the widow to borrow many empty jars from all her neighbors. Do not borrow a few, I said. When she brought them, I ordered her to shut the door on herself and her sons and begin pouring the oil into the jars. Miraculously, the oil continued to flow until all the jars were full. When she informed me that all the jars were full and the oil had stopped flowing, I said to her, Go, sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. After the widow left with her jars full of oil, a feeling of deep reflection came over me, Elisha. The miracle of the oil was not only a demonstration of divine power, but also a lesson about faith, 
providence and the importance of acting in accordance with divine guidance. It was a reminder to me and to all who hear this story that when God acts, He does so fully and completely. God is not limited by our conceptions of possibility. He is the God of more than enough. Another time, during a famine, I was with the sons of the prophets at Gilgal. As we sat before me, I said to my servant, Put on the large pot and boil some broth for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine, from which he gathered his wild gourds. He filled his cloak and, when he came back, cut them into the pot of broth, not knowing that they were poisonous. As soon as they began to eat of the broth, they cried out, Man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. Then I said, Bring flour. He threw it into the pot and said, Give it to the people, so they can eat, and there was nothing bad left in the pot. There was also a time when a man brought the sons of the prophets some bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley and fresh ears of corn. It was not enough for a hundred men, but I said, Give it to the people so they can eat, for this is what the Lord says, They will eat and have some left over. And so it was. They ate and had some left over, just as the Lord had said. My journey as a prophet has led me to interact with kings and commanders. One such interaction was with Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man in the eyes of his master and highly esteemed, because through him the Lord had given deliverance to the Syrians. But he was a leper. An Israelite girl who served Naaman's wife said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would recover him from his leprosy. Naaman came with his master's recommendation to me, bringing valuable gifts. However, I did not even go out to meet him. Instead, I sent a messenger to tell him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will become like that of a little child, and you will be clean. Naaman, irritated at not being treated with more deference, and at being told to bathe in an Israelite river, initially refused. But his servants persuaded him to follow my instruction. He dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had said, and his flesh was restored, becoming clean like the flesh of a little boy. After this, Naaman returned to me, he and all his retinue, and stood before me and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore accept a gift from your servant. But I said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will not accept it. He insisted, but I refused. After Naaman had left, an incident occurred with Gehazi my servant. He coveted the gifts Naaman had brought and secretly followed him. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him and asked, Is everything all right? Gehazi lied, saying that I had sent him to ask for a talent of silver and two sets of clothes for two young men of the sons of the prophets. Naaman promptly gave Gehazi more than he had asked. When Gehazi returned and stood before me, I asked him where he had come from. He lied again, saying that he had not gone anywhere. But I knew the truth and said, Did not my heart go with you when that man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it time to receive money, to receive clothing, olive groves, vineyards, sheep, oxen, and male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman will cling to you and your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from me a leper, white as snow. After Gehazi's departure, my heart was heavy with reflection, sorrow for his dishonest act, and the gravity of the punishment I had inflicted on him occupied my thoughts. I, Elisha, as a prophet of God, had been placed in a position of great authority and power, and with that came great responsibility. The situation with Gehazi was a painful reminder of the consequences of corruption and greed, and of the importance of integrity in serving God. The desire for wealth and material comfort is a constant temptation, 
and even those who walk with God can be led astray. This reinforced in me the importance of teaching and modeling a life of simplicity, contentment, and focus on spiritual things. With these reflections, I continued on my way, aware of the challenges of ministry and the constant need to seek wisdom and guidance from God, both for myself and for those under my guidance. Another time, the sons of the prophets told me that the place where we lived was too small for us. They proposed that we go to the Jordan, cut down timber, and build a larger place. I agreed and went with them. While one of them was chopping wood, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my lord, for it was borrowed. I asked him where it had fallen, and he showed me the place. So I cut a piece of wood and threw it there, and the axe had floated. I said, Pick it up, and he reached out and took it. After the incident with the axe head floating in the Jordan River, I, Alicia, withdrew for a moment of introspection and reflection. That miracle, although minor compared to others that God had worked through me, carried profound and meaningful lessons. The simplicity of the miracle, the restoration of a borrowed object, caused me to ponder God's attention and care, even in the little things of life. I was reflecting on the importance of daily life and how God is interested in our daily concerns. The young prophet was concerned about something that many might consider trivial, a borrowed axe, but to God, every concern we have is worthy of attention. I continued on my way, increasingly aware of God's constant presence in every aspect of life, and more committed to trusting Him in every circumstance, knowing that He takes care of every detail. There was a time when the king of Syria was at war with Israel. He had secret plans, but I was able to reveal these plans to the king of Israel. Whenever the king of Syria planned an ambush, I would send a message to the king of Israel, warning him not to pass through that place. This frustrated the king of Syria, who suspected treachery among his own men. But one of his servants said, It is not one of us, my lord the king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel, who is telling the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. In his anger, the king of Syria sent horses, chariots, and a large army by night to surround the city where I was staying. In the morning my servant saw the army and was terrified. Oh, my lord, what shall we do? he asked. I replied, Do not be afraid, for there are more with us than with them, then I prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. When the Syrians came down against me, I prayed to the Lord, Strike this people with blindness. And he struck them with blindness as I had asked. Then I said to the Syrians, This is not the way nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. So I brought them to Samaria. When we came to Samaria, I prayed, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw that they were in the midst of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked me, My father, should I kill them? I answered, Do not kill them. Feed them and give them something to drink, and then send them back to their master. So a great feast was prepared for them, and after they had eaten and drunk, they were sent back to their master. And the bands of the Syrians never again entered the land of Israel. With these thoughts in mind, I continued to serve as God's messenger, aware of the power of his words and the responsibility to speak and act in accordance with his will in all circumstances. The story of Elisha, as told in scripture, ends with the miracle that occurred after his death when a man was brought back to life by touching his bones. This event symbolizes Elisha's lasting impact and spiritual influence even after his departure from this world. There are no further detailed accounts of his life after this point in scripture. Elisha served as a powerful instrument of God, performing many miracles, counseling kings, and impacting the nation of Israel in profound ways. 
His life is an example of dedicated faith in God and His divine purposes. My name is Alicia, and this is my story.